good afternoon, Fintan. Um, good afternoon, Deirdre. Deirdre Heenan from Ulster University, and I have the pleasure of introducing today's speaker, Fintan O'Toole, who's known to all of you um, as a journalist, broadcaster, and award-winning author. I do have your book sitting beside me as a useful prop. Um, Fintan and I spoke in Derry two years ago about Brexit, but much has changed. In fact, the world has changed in a way that we couldn't have thought about. So Fintan's going to give us some thoughts on Ireland and the post-Brexit world and the lessons from COVID-19 for about 10 or 15 minutes or so. And then we will have a, a more informal discussion about the implications of both for all Ireland and the world globally. So over to you, Fintan. Terrific. Um, thanks very much. Thanks a lot for, uh, to, to Gareth uh, and the festival for the invitation. Um, really sorry I can't be with everybody in person, but hopefully next year in Derry. And, uh, <laughs> uh, we'll, we will get back to, I think, what's irreplaceable, uh, which is that, that sense of, of uh, direct contact. Um, but it's lovely in the meantime to be able to talk to you, Deirdre, and, and uh, to talk to everybody else uh, in a virtual way, at least. Um, an interesting place to start, I thought, might be actually just to go back to uh, early January, the first week in January, which now seems like it could be 20 years away, <laughs> when Boris Johnson first mentioned the, the coronavirus. So his, his first public mention of the word was in a big speech in Greenwich, uh, where he was celebrating the fact that Britain had now left the European Union. Uh, and the talking up the um, the great opportunity for the new golden age, right, which was which was uh, undoubtedly going to come, uh, and it was striking actually that he was speaking under these great paintings in in the in in, in the great maritime um, uh, hall in Greenwich of um, celebrating um, King William the uh, Third and celebrating. Uh, as, as Johnson said, the union, the great, the great moment of the creation of the union. Um, and he slipped into this uh, reference to coronavirus. So he was talking about how this great new age of British mercantile power was going to arise. Um, and we should be wary of people who are warning us about this coronavirus thing, which is coming. Um, don't let them interfere with, you know, with, with our great hopes and people talking about protection and all this kind of stuff. You know, this is freebooting um, mercantilism coming back, you know, and all this stuff about, um, you know, people wanting to protect themselves is, is, is just nonsense. So we're not to listen to it. Um, that, was, that was his first reference, in fact, to the coronavirus crisis. So it was interesting that at that moment there was some kind of intertwining in a way of... of uh, of these two crises um, that, that face all of us in, in both parts of Ireland uh, and, of course, in, in the wider archipelago. Uh, uh, it, it might be just worth saying that there, there are a few ways in which the coronavirus crisis um, has itself, uh, if not altered the landscape, it certainly um, highlighted uh, some of the ways in which the landscape is is already changing the political landscape. Um, uh, so the, there's there's three really big things I suppose that, uh, that that have come out of the coronavirus crisis and 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 uh, the way it's it's been dealt with. Um, one of these is actually not very noticeable because it's about what didn't happen. Um, but if you're if you're in in the south of Ireland and you're thinking about this, it's 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 really quite remarkable. And it's 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 simply this: it, at almost any other period over the last uh, almost hundred years since the foundation of the Irish state, if the Dublin government was faced with an international crisis, who would it look to in the first instance for guidance? London. It would look to, <laughs> and quite reasonably in one way, right? You'd say, well, okay, we're a small country. We have some expertise, but a limited amount of expertise. Um, the British government has this enormous apparatus of science and of experience and of global power. Um, in the first instance, you would imagine the sort of senior civil servants in Dublin on the phone to their counterparts in Whitehall saying, what are you doing about this? How are you handling this? What, what, what do you think is the best way to go here? 
Uh, what's very striking, of course, is that that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't in anybody's head to say, oh, look, London is the place to look here for, um, for, for guidance and expertise right? and, and uh, reassurance. Uh, that's putting it very, very mildly, right? It, 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 Dublin was looking in very different directions, right? The European Centre for Disease Control, the World Health Organization. So it, it, that itself, in terms of what didn't happen, was telling us about a really pretty fundamental shift in, in attitudes in governmental circles. Uh, and I mean that in the broadest sense in, in the South. Um, beginning the process of thinking about Ireland as a European country and as a member of the international community uh, and only thereafter as 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 a part of the the the, the Atlantic archipelago or whatever else we work on. Um, the second thing that's been very very striking uh, has been of course the way in which the the coronavirus crisis has played out somewhat differently in each of the constituent parts of the United Kingdom. Again, this would have been unthinkable maybe not, you know, 10 years ago, but certainly 20 years ago. You could not have imagined sort of a single crisis, a single wave of problem washing over the UK and the, the constituent parts dealing with it in, in, in different ways. Um, obviously, this has been most striking in relation to Scotland. You know, the Scottish government having a different kind of voice, a different kind of presence, often very different advice uh, to, to, to the one in London. But you see it in you see it in Wales and, of course, in the usual complicated ways you see it in Belfast, too, you know, with, with the very um, uh, uh, complex dance that we've seen between um, Sinn Féin and the DUP as to whether the lead should be taken from London or Dublin. But nevertheless, that cocktail producing a different kind of response. It's subtly different, not, we're not saying that these are kind of, you know, huge radical uh, shifts, but, but, but they're very noticeable, right? And, and again, this is stuff that we, would, we wouldn't have expected 20 years ago. Um, and it's pointing to something again, right? So just as the first thing is pointing towards the way in which D Dublin, broadly speaking, is thinking mm. in much more international and European terms, the second one is showing us how the constituent parts of the United Kingdom are becoming more independent. I don't, you don't even have to think about that in terms of sovereignty, but just in terms of the way they operate, but also in terms of the way their populations think. So people in Scotland were looking to Edinburgh for, for you know, who's the authority? Who's in charge here? Yeah. <laughs> who's who's the daddy of money? You know, um, oh, it's Nicola, that's fine. You know, uh, uh, and equally uh, strikingly in, in Wales, you know, there was, a, there was a Welsh discourse about coronavirus. Um, so, so this is showing us how devolution and the, the, the strains on, on the union are, are kind of playing out. And the third big thing that, that that's, this thing has shown us is that, um, frankly, the power of the British state, that, that idea which has dominated the context for all discussions about the Union or United Ireland or everything else, which is the power of the British state. Well, you start looking at it and saying, well, what power? You know, wh wh where is this power? Uh, it is absolutely tragic, and I don't think anybody can or should take any pleasure in it at all, but it's, it's a reality that England left to its own devices in relation to, to, to this crisis um, has proven to have a remarkably inept response. Mm. And that's not a political statement. It's, 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 it's a statement of fact, right? It's a statement which is borne out in the figures that we've seen, which show that the highest excess mortality in Europe has been in England. Mm. And, and we know the reasons for that, where right? we know the the inability to, to, to act in a timely manner, to make decisions and follow, follow through on them, the pursuit of fantasies like herd immunity, uh, the bizarre English exceptionalism of looking for, you know, uh, you know to just take very briefly two examples of that. One was about the need for ventilators in hospitals. No, we're not going to just buy ventilators or, or, or license existing ventilators. We're going to have like a space program in England to invent new English ventilators, you know, 
a completely insane time wasting uh, money wasting project which produced not a single new design right uh, they ended up doing what any sensible person would have done which is just go with what you already have and just get more of them into hospitals the second one would be the app you know the tracing app we can't do the same tra tracing app as everybody else in the developed world is doing oh god no you <laughs> know we have to have our special red white blue app you know which is going to be developed in in the isle of white you know and 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 that of course then turns out also to be a disaster and to go nowhere and to have to be abandoned and these are just examples of the way in which same kind of mentality that you have in brexit this exceptionalism this english nationalism feeding into the coronavirus response with with absolutely tragic consequences i mean neil ferguson who's regarded as the great um, expert on the the statistical epidemiology in england has said that at least 20,000 people died unnecessarily because of these mm. decisions. I mean, this is historically unthinkable. You know, uh, the, the, the pursuit of these fantasies is, is, is literally murderous. So, so these three things are, are telling us that, and this is what, you know, huge crises do, they, they don't necessarily transform anything. They expose all the weaknesses that are already there or all of the ways in which society and politics are already changing. So th these things then, um, they, they would be huge in themselves, right? If, if this was all that was going on, um, you would say, okay, this is, these are seismic shifts. But of course, um, it's very easy for us um, and a great relief in some ways for all of us to, to stop thinking about Brexit and to, you know, to, to, to say, to forget. I heard somebody on radio this morning in, in Dublin uh, expressing shock, they just sort of they'd heard somebody mention Brexit on on, on a news item, you know. Oh God, that's still going on. You know, that oh, it's not done. I remember that. Uh, and it's not done. And and indeed, it's 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 um, it's coming down the tracks very very rapidly. So uh, you know, you've you've written brilliantly about this, and 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 you know, you're more aware of it in some ways than I am. But the the what we're looking at, you know, is is a situation in which if you were to bet on rational or irrational outcomes uh the 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 clever bookie you know would always put the odds on the irrational ones mm. for a good reason right which, which is that that's been the story of brexit right so mm. so oh. if you take this narrative where has it started and where has it ended up <laughs> well it hasn't quite ended up but where are we now Remember that it starts with an overwhelming statements from the Brexiteers themselves that Britain will have an incredibly close relationship after Brexit with the European Union economically. Um, they'll be very close at all sorts of political levels and cooperation and all that sort of stuff is going to be going on. More or less telling people you're not going to really notice any great difference here, except that we will be theoretically sovereign and that will make us feel good. Um, and of course, no, I mean, Boris Johnson said like no sane person would ever think of leaving the single market. Yeah. Um, and the dynamic of it all the way through has been, you know, w once they got the, the vote passed in 2016, has been towards the extremes. Uh, remember that you now have a British cabinet, each of whom had to sign up to a loyalty declaration that they would support a no deal Brexit in order to be allowed into the cabinet. Right? So it's, it's become self-selective. Uh, it's become self-reinforcing. And even though at a rational level you said look there has to be a deal i mean you know it, 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 it's so insane to think about there being no deal um, irrationality has always trumped that rationality so far so as well as the things that the coronavirus has, has shown us uh, we're also facing the possibility the strong possibility of either no deal at all which would have huge implications of course for northern ireland um, and is, is, is a real possibility if you look at the lack of preparation, right? So, so why is there no preparation for how the Northern Ireland Protocol is going to be, um, to be implemented? Um, and that's only one example. You, you know, every single aspect of, of, of the realities of this, there seems to have been, you know, almost no real engagement with the reality of what this might mean, which does suggest that a, that a no deal is, is, is in their heads, you know? Mm -hmm. um, or I, I think more likely an, 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 an extremely minimal no tariff sort of deal, which, which doesn't address any of the larger uh, issues, the economic issues, trade issues around 
rules of origin, around standards, around you know how you do services, but also doesn't really um, address the political questions about you know where the hell Britain is. So all of these things are are pointing us in a a, a direction of of radical instability. Uh, you, you know the. The, the 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 whatever is over you know that great phrase that won Boris Johnson an election you know it's not the implications of the stuff that you and I were talking about a couple of years ago the rise of English nationalism for Ireland uh, and for the architecture of relationships on these two islands yeah there's so much in there Ben I don't know where to start but I mean to go back to your your three points which I suppose to start by saying we are in incredible times. Um, we didn't think that Brexit would be knocked off the agenda by this COVID-19 and the response to it by the British government has frankly been appalling. And not just the response, but as you talk about throughout the Brexit negotiations, the constant denial, delusions, the ideas of this exceptionalism that we would do it differently. And I'm just wondering, um, on your first point, when you talked about Dublin and that automatic reaction of looking towards London and saying, well, what should we do here? How do we take advice from you? What are you thinking of doing? Now, remembering that we were in a process where we had um, no government, essentially. Uh, we had a caretaker government. The Taoiseach had had uh, a pretty appalling time at the polls. But in coronavirus, he seemed to come into his own. Perhaps it was because of his medical training, but he made some very important speeches. But there seemed to be almost a newfound confidence in the leadership of Ireland um, in the people who were making decisions. And yes, they, they bypassed London and they went to Europe. And do you think that's because they now, there is now a mindset that says we are part of a much bigger piece here. We are not this small island off the UK. We are actually in our own right. Um, a strong political entity and you can, I know I'm sure you've read the article in the Financial Times that talks about the political strength of Ireland uh, and how this came about and I think they're almost amazed and, and trying to work out how Ireland found itself in the centre of the world stage. Yeah, um, I, I, yeah, it's, it's, it's a great point, you know, I, 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 I'm not used to finding myself in the position of praising Irish governments, <laughs> <laughs> so it's not my job. Um, but but you know uh, the confidence. So 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 Brexit itself has been a huge part of this, right? So mm. so first of all, of course, the realization that Britain and particularly England is in real trouble here, you know, and and has been taken over by all the things that you were articulating, you know, the the delusional mentality, the exceptionalism, mm. the inability to match statements and language to fact you know <laughs> this is complete divorce between what you say and what what's real uh i think that was a terrible shock for irish governments i mean remember you know they were very used to dealing on a very friendly basis with with whitehall not just politicians but civil servants you know like they've been they've been working together on the on, on obviously on the peace process for so long but also, of course, working together in, in Europe, you know, they're very close allies in, in the European Union. And they were very used to this relationship and quite cozy in it. And, and so I, I think they were shocked out of any complacency about that by the way Brexit uh, has unfolded. But secondly, I think the second part of your point is, is also really true, you know, which is that the, the confidence then came from the fact that, oh God, we're in a real crisis here. And it's a, it, it, the, you know, the, the crisis, the existential crisis came down to the border issue, of course, you know, yeah. we, here's something we just cannot have, you know, we cannot allow this to happen. If it happens, it's catastrophic for, for our island. Um, and so we have to stop it. How do we stop it? Well, you know, the only way to stop this is by really upping your game diplomatically, you know, by, mm -hmm. um, you know, working in an extraordinarily coherent way primarily within the European Union, you know, making the Irish border issue a European issue, not an Irish issue. But also if you look at, you know, the way they worked with, with, um, with those American politicians who were still on the same spectrum, you know, principally Democrats, of course, you know, but, yeah. uh, you know, the, 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 the way of, of internationalizing that issue, 
making it one of which Ireland was not isolated um, and holding their nerve through it as well. I mean, there was huge pressure uh, coming from London, yeah. you know, to, uh, to say, look, don't, don't bother your pretty little green heads about this. It'll be all right. You know, you're just mm -hmm. making a fuss. It's trust us, we'll sort all this out, you know. And, and not giving into that was very important, I think, in terms of enhancing that confidence. Uh, and I think that definitely did then play into the coronavirus crisis uh, response, which is by no means perfect, by the way. You know, I'm, like, I'm not, wouldn't for a moment say that the Irish government got everything right. I think made terrible mistakes in relation to nursing homes uh, and residential institutions in particular. But in comparison to... If you look either west or east, if you you know if you look to America or Britain, with the two countries that Ireland will be used to looking to uh, for a start. I mean, Ireland does look like paradise. You know, yeah. uh, politicians behaved benignly and responsibly. Even if people were making mistakes, you felt they were making mistakes. You know, for for good reasons. You know, they were yeah. they, they they weren't they weren't being malign about this. You know, or or they weren't pursuing. Uh, you know crazy hairs all over the place they were they were trying to do their best and and it was a, a, a population that could at least trust that in its government you know, at least think actually you know however much we like them or don't like them in this crisis they're on our side that's an, that's an incredibly important test of a democracy you know and and I think broadly speaking it's it's true that Irish democracy pretty much passed that test yeah, I think it did. I think there was trust and, and the public have an understanding that we are in unprecedented times and there are challenges, but I think they felt they were getting the truth and um, what was being told to them was where we were at the time and the difficulties weren't really sugar-coated. But um, to go back to your previous point, and I suppose the point that I've always been interested in is the devolved settlement. And is it that COVID-19 perhaps has cemented further the importance of the devolution settlement in the UK and actually then really started to raise questions about the future of the union. I know we talked about this in terms of Brexit, but just as you said, um, in Scotland, for example, people really looked to Edinburgh for their answers. Nicola Sturgeon was there. She was there on a daily basis responding to Scottish issues, as was Mark Drakeford came into his own in Wales, I think, and, and played a very strong role in reassuring the Welsh public as to what was going on and the action that had been taken. Northern Ireland is always going to be slightly different, but it was interesting that um, the politics eventually took second order to the public health issues and they looked to the south, they looked east, but they began to say, we've got to have a bespoke answer for what's going on here in Northern Ireland, recognising that we have a dispersed population and the issues were slightly different. And I think they were getting to the stage, maybe after a rocky start of saying, we are in a position now to take the best of both worlds as were, and look at what the World Health Organization is saying, look at what the chief scientific officer is saying, but in the end, try to do what's best for this population. And I don't think I could have imagined a, a prime minister addressing the nation and having to repeatedly remind himself that he was speaking to England. He was not speaking for the UK. And that in itself, I thought, was extraordinary and something that didn't really get an awful lot of um, coverage in the media. And um, people would then on Twitter or in the papers talk about the UK or Britain. And inevitably, people from the devolved regions came back and said, actually, you're not speaking about us. We've got our own government. So I think in a way, what has happened in terms of COVID has really strengthened and cemented the view that devolution is good. And we should try to make it work because, yes, the U we're in the UK, but we're all very different and facing different issues and the solutions will be different. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely fascinating the way you put it, you know, and, and, and uh, certainly from my perspective, you know, what I've been watching, all of that absolutely holds true. Um, and it is very profound, you know, because... Uh, Historically, you would expect in an existential crisis, right, where, where you know, huge numbers of lives are at stake, that tends to be where the old habits kind of kick back in, you know. Yeah. <laughs> People, you know, you, you, you rally around the flag, the existing flag, you know. And, you almost go to the comfort blanket, don't you? Yeah. Makes you feel yeah. safe. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's very interesting. So, and of course, that, that actually happens, right? So if you look at the polls, 
in Britain, certainly, uh, the initial polls, you know, you did have a big rallying around Boris Johnson. Mm -hmm. It's hard to remember it now, but, you know, um, I, of course, the same thing happened with Donald Trump. So, you know, <laughs> but, you know, that people, people, because people desperately want to believe that whoever is in charge, and it, it's almost like, I don't care who's in charge. I just want them to, to keep me safe. I want to believe in them. I want to know they're telling me the truth. I want to know that they have a really good grasp of what's going on. I want to know that they're listening to the best advice and processing it. And I want to know that they're able to give me reassurance that isn't just sort of bland reassurance, but it's actually based on some reality. So that all happened in, in, in England. Uh, mm -hmm. I think more, more broadly in, 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 in the UK, in the initial stages of the, of the crisis, but it dissipated very fast. Yeah. And, and, and I think this is, I think for all the reasons you're saying is absolutely fascinating historical development you know people start looking for reassurance to to their own devolved entities you know and mm -hmm. and some of this was accidental right in the sense that uh you know leave aside any political preferences or ideology would you prefer to buy a used car from Michael Sturgeon or from Boris Johnson? <laughs> <laughs> like a simple kind of the personality question is is important, you know. Um, and it, it 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 because Johnson is such an extreme, you know, as a bluffer, as a person who has built a career on mendacity, you know, on on lying basically. <laughs> um, <laughs> he, he he was always going to get into this, this sort of stage where you know, people's ability to believe anything that he was saying was 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 going to be very, very strained. Mm -hmm. So that was the accidental side of it. But then I think exactly as you were saying, it 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 showed us, you know, that if it could bear the weight of the Christ of this coronavirus crisis, it showed us that the devolved settlements have actually become very robust. You mm -hmm. know, even as you say in Northern Ireland. So you would say the least robust of them, you know, the one that's had so, so for obvious mm -hmm. reasons so much difficulty in sustaining itself um, under the pressure of the crisis actually turned out to be able to function. Yeah. Uh, and as, as you said, I'd be very interested to hear how you think this is going to play out in Northern Ireland, but I mean, do, do you think it's going to have longer term consequences in, in, in terms of the way people think about Stormont and think about the devolved settlement um, that, 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 you know, under this pressure, it was capable of producing some kind of functioning consensus. I think it will. I think uh, we have to remember that they were really just back in office uh, when they were faced with this. So they hadn't really even got time to get used to their new office furniture. Then suddenly they're faced with a, a global health emergency. Uh, it's hardly ideal for a new government. But I think most people, if they were trying to be fair, would say they performed well, well under the circumstances and used moved away from political rhetoric to start talking for the first time I ever heard talking about the evidence. Let's let's follow the evidence. Let's do what's best. Let's learn from other countries. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the usual suspects. We can look at other countries and see what they're doing. And it seemed to me a much more mature approach to politics. I do think the longer term issue will be people started to be much more comfortable here talking about an all island approach. Um, yeah. now, it depends how you said it, whether it was a shared island, and we know here language is important. Um, but in the end, what people were beginning to say is, we share a landmass. Whatever you think about that, that is a fact. And surely we should be mature enough to say that in sharing this landmass, we must be able to find the benefits of this, harness the benefits of being this island, make it work for everyone, and then let's set the politics aside almost, which is unthinkable in a way for us to be having those type of conversations and I do think now we're beginning tentatively to start talking about well what are the implications here for cross-border health in the end we're still a small island is it really sensible that we have separate uh, learning systems that we have separate professional systems um, wouldn't it be better wouldn't we have better outcomes if we shared some of our resources and our knowledge um, and we, we did it in a way around the children's heart unit and we have shared cancer services. But I think this has opened a much uh, broader conversation around, you know, if we could share our knowledge in terms of animal health 
and did it in, in the face of the foot and mouth crisis where Ian Paisley was talked about the Catholic and Protestant cows. Surely it was only a matter of time before something came along that made us say, um, healthcare is something we all value. Why is it that we are operating in these separate silos and couldn't we do something to try and harness the benefits of being an island, an island economy? Um, so I think that's the long-term implication in terms of health. I mean, I don't ever imagine that we're going to start saying, well, there's a, a vaccination in the South, but we in the North can't have it. We're going to have to wait until London produces something. Those days are over. Uh, um, and I think what we have witnessed in the Northern Ireland is a, a growing political maturity to say, ideologically, you can have your own ideology and your own identity, but it doesn't change the reality of the geography and where we sit and who we share this island with. Um, I don't know if you've witnessed much of that conversation around healthcare. And, and you did mention care homes and care homes here were a particularly damning indictment of lack of preparation, uh, inability to see who the vulnerable populations were. And, and that happened north and south of this island. And I would like to think that when we are reflecting on what happened and how we ensure that it doesn't happen again, we won't just look to what happened here, but we will also look to what happened in the south and say, did they do something differently? Or were they in exactly the same position? What can we collectively learn from this about better health care, better outcomes, and better predictions of what is likely to happen? I, I couldn't agree more with that, you know, and, and I, I really do think we have to have this, this conversation. And I think it's a broader point in a way, which is that, you know, it's a sort of cart before the horse sort of argument, you know, let, let's start talking about what we share and, and how the island works before we start mm -hmm. talking about the political structures. You know, political structures in any democracy should arise out of what is it you need them to do, you know? <laughs> and so if we need new political structures, and I think we do, but, but we, we really need to start talking about what are the things that those political structures are for. And what they're for is, is exactly the same north of the border as, as it is south of the border, as it is or should be in any democracy, right? Which is the public good. Mm. And the public good in terms of health has been taken away from all of us, you know? So one of the things the coronavirus has come along to remind us of is that for most of human history, right? public health is vastly more important than private health. You know? mm -hmm. um, yes, it's a terrible tragedy if you have a heart attack or you have cancer, whatever, it's, it's awful. But, but the things that most people died from too young throughout most of history, apart from wars, you know, were plagues, mm -hmm. uh, illnesses. Uh, I'm old enough, you know, to remember mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> on buses in Dublin, you know, little, there were always kind of, notices saying um, please do not expectorate you know <laughs> um, which meant spit you know i remember spelling it out what does that mean daddy you know but you know it was public health it was the, the sense that actually you know if 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 somebody has a disease you might get that disease off them communicable diseases were you know part of people's lives polio uh, tb before that you know so all of this kind of stuff and we, we've, we've sort of allowed ourselves to drift into a mentality of privatizing healthcare, uh, either doing that literally in terms of, you know, making it a business, which has gone much further, of course, in the South than it has in the North, uh, mm. or in, in terms of the, the images you see of healthcare, you know, which is, which gym are you going to, you know, um, what's your diet, all of which are very, very good and necessary and important things, but that's what health is about and not this sort of collective interdependence. So yeah. we, we've had a really shocking reminder of this collective interdependence. Uh, and what we should be doing is entering into real conversations now about what works and what doesn't work in, in health and social care systems, Mm -hmm. uh, on an island this size, you know, what, what is it that we can share? How can we help each other out in this? Um, and I think you're absolutely right. I, I, I think the crisis in the, the nursing homes and, and care homes, almost exactly the same on, on both sides of the border and for exactly the same reasons, you know, which, yeah. are, which are reasons fundamentally to do with social injustice and fundamentally to do with the way in which, you know, you're brilliant and all this, but the way in which 
so many uh, people, once they reach a certain age, are out of sight and therefore out of mind, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, and there's a huge amount to learn. Yeah. And if it does have to be learned, though, I think this is the interesting point, is that this is not about a takeover by the South of the North. I think it might be about the South um, and the North, you know, jointly going back to the benefits of the greatest uh, achievement in British civilization, which is the National Health Service. Yeah. Which we've never had in the South. And, and also in terms, I suppose, of social trends, we, we have the same demographic trends and we are now facing into an older population, a growing older population, which from my perspective is a great thing. Um, I, I get kind of worried when people talk about the tsunami of aging because my view is I'd like to live as long as possible. Thank you very much. But I do think that our governments haven't really given it enough thought. And when you look at well, for what, what we used to call in the countryside, the hen housing of older people, is this really what we want? How can we not have a system where we're ensuring that we know from our own research that people want to age in place? They want to stay at home as long as possible. And whilst we say that that's our objective, we don't seem to be able on either side of the border to have a system where we have domiciliary care, where we really thought through social care. And the other thing I thought that came through um, the response from both was the implicit aging, and or sorry, not aging, the implicit ageism that is rife in our society. Because I think if this pandemic had been disproportionately affecting younger people, and you've been turning on the television to hear of children dying on a daily basis, you know, we've been stopping in our tracks. we have been saying, you know, we, we, can't, we can't deal with this. We can't compute this. But almost implicitly it was older people with underlying conditions. Ergo, they were going to die anyway. Um, in fact, some people explicitly said it. Some of the language in the media about harvesting older people, older people dropping like flies. I think, again, it has raised social issues as well as political issues that we need to talk about. What, what do we see as the value of older people? Do we really want to separate them out from our society? Or don't we think they have an intrinsic value? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I think that's the kind of key question when we're talking about, you know, whatever the post-Brexit um, settlement is, you know. And, and this, this question, you know, about people trying to engage in this, you know, the, the new Irish government talking about shared space or shared islands and I know the SCLP is launching the, 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 its initiative and, you know, various people are trying to think about this sort of stuff. Um, but, but if we are going to talk about, that, let, let's, let's go back to those basics. Let, let's talk about, you know, what kind of social values do we have? What, 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 what you know, how, how, what sense of citizenship do we have? Is citizenship mm -hmm. just whether your passport is British or Irish? Or, or is it, you know, where do you belong? Where do you have a right mm -hmm. to belong? Um, even that idea of shared space, for example, you know, the share, shared mm -hmm. island, shared space, which, you know, I've been talking about for years and goes back to, you know, John Hume talking about it. And it's in the Irish constitution now, effectively, you know, sharing the territory. Um, sharing space is not just about the island, of course, it's about every one of our communities. And, and yeah. this speaks to your point about, about older people, for example, you know, if you segregate people off, you are saying you don't share our space. Yeah. And once people don't share your space, then they don't count. You know, they're, 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 they're really not in your, in your eye line. Um, and I think, you, you know, the, we've had this terrible shock, but, but also we've been reminded of the, I don't know how you feel about this, but, you know, there's been a lot of very negative talk for 30 years now about the loss of social capital and all that yeah. kind of stuff and we're becoming more atomized and we're all this. actually you know in in one way the response to this crisis by ordinary people you know has has shown us that that's just not true yeah, I agree. people have been perfectly capable of of listening mm -hmm. to collective messages of acting on them of mm -hmm. being really responsible of course there are there are exceptions to this but you know the vast majority of people have actually tried to be careful and responsible and they've tried to look out for their neighbors particularly their older neighbors or more, more vulnerable people. You know, there's been a real sense of solidarity. And uh, there's no point in talking about a 32 county entity or a United Kingdom or whatever union you want to talk about. If, if, if it's not based on solidarity, you know, if it's not based on, on a sense that actually we, we look out for each other in, mm -hmm. in some fundamental way and care about each other, you know. 
And and I suppose that goes back to what you were the question you were raising about you know well you know union is saying well you know you can have your own conversation and and we're not willing to talk to you. Well, okay, if that's if that's about the political architecture, if that conversation isn't the one we can fully have yet, mm-hmm. there's lots more stuff we can talk about, you know. And it's it's the talking and the engagement that that that's really critical at this stage. I mean, I think I think as you were saying, we're at a moment when we realise that uh, stuff that we took for granted can't be taken for granted anymore. Um, mm-hmm. And that we have to go back to a sense of of codependence, interdependence. You know, yeah. we depend on each other as much on this island as 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 we do within our within our own communities. And thinking I mean, about how we could make that positive, I think, is the big question. Yeah, and I suppose we've had a lot of discussion in the media here about the development of the new unit in the T shocks office and what exactly does that mean and what will it mean? And of course, some are very dismissive, saying this is just uh, signing off a piece of paper that there are no plans. Uh, there's no vision. We don't know what the time scale is. We don't know our, is this going to be senior civil servants or is it going to be some poor person that's given this as their new job title? And of course, a lot of cynicism. But I do think if we're going to have a conversation which is going to be meaningful, then just as we've been talking about, those conversations need to be around the economy post Brexit, uh, our healthcare system post Brexit. What do we want for our children? Um, what do we believe the basics in education that we're aspiring to? But I, I can understand fully how unionist leaders would still say, no, actually, we don't want to be part of that because we still believe that uh, in the end, the SDLP, although they put together this commission and Sinn Féin still share an objective, which is essentially to get rid of us. Um, so why on earth would we be talking about our own demise and I'm just wondering, how do we develop conversations that change that perceptive perception and, and make it inclusive in a way that is meaningful? Yeah, you know, I, I, I think that is the key question. Um, I think the first thing is, is to realize that um, whether you're a unionist or nationalist, and I think we were talking about this before, but, you know, this stuff is not our story anymore. You know, so the whole Irish history story over the last 150 years has been about unionism and nationalism on the island and the conflict between them. Um, that's not the big thing that's happening. <laughs> the big actual thing that's happening is happening on the other island. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's it's the rise of English nationalism, the rise of Scottish nationalism, maybe a Welsh identity now actually coming more and more to the fore. Uh, we've had consistently now for a couple of months significant majorities in favor of Scottish independence. We have the Scottish assembly elections coming up at which the SNP will be seeking a mandate for another referendum. I'm not saying we know where that's going, but what we do know is it's not, it's not our story, it's not in our gifts, you know. <laughs> um, if, if, if Scotland votes for independence, well, it, it's all very well to say, you know, I'm a unionist, but what are you united, what are you united to, you know? Yeah. Um, if, if, as we're seeing, and you made this very strong point earlier on, you know, if, if Boris Johnson's having to address the nation mm-hmm. as the English nation, you know, <laughs> this is stuff that just was not on the radar, you know, yeah. years ago, even five years ago. It's these are these are big, big changes, and they're happening whether we like it or not. You know, they're 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 happening, uh, and they're dynamic. And Brexit, remember, is is, is dynamic, right? So. If I were a unionist and I were I were interested in preserving uh, the union and British identity, first question I'd be asking myself is: Is this may seem ridiculous, but I, I think it's a key question. Right? Is is a is a, a, a British identity in Northern Ireland dependent on the union, or is it something which which can be preserved even if the union changes in very radical ways, and even if Northern Ireland changes in very radical ways? I think it has to be. And I think that's absolutely implicit in the Belfast Agreement and in the Irish Constitution. W- one of the things I think we did talk about this before, but it's just worth you know, briefly going back to it, right? Remember what happened in, 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 in 98 in the South, which was the, the, the change in Articles 2 and 3 in the Constitution. And the new formulation of Irish nationalism passed by 95% of the electors in the South is not about territory anymore. You know, it's, it, it's, it's about... Um, uniting in harmony and friendship all the people who share the island 
in all the diversity of their identities and traditions. <laughs> now, that accepts that the diversity of traditions and identities is permanent. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's no longer even theoretically about saying, you know, ah, you're all really Irish and just get with, get with, the, get with the program, get on board the train. It's actually about saying um, Irishness itself now is, 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 is something which can only be expressed in a pluralistic multiple way. And a big part of that plurality is Britishness. You know, it's a British identity of, of people in Northern Ireland. Um, so uh, I think sincere unionists, I think, have to be thinking about that. And they have to be thinking about, about what happened to them. I mean, it, I, I think it's kind of remarkable that they've sort of buried Boris Johnson's betrayal of the DUP as if yeah. it kind of didn't happen, you know. It's, it's astonishing. Thing, isn't it? you know? Yeah. And 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 it's 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 dynamic, right? So so just you know remember that it's not just a one-off act, right? Mm -hmm. Because it implicitly separates Northern Ireland from the rest of the UK in an ongoing way. So as the European Union changes, Northern Ireland changes with it, and as the 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 UK you know retreats into whatever it's going to retreat into, uh, Northern Ireland separates more and more from it. So Boris Johnson has created a dynamic of instability in terms of Northern Ireland's relationship to the, to, to the European Union. Irish nationalists didn't do that. Right? <laughs> you know, the Brits did it. <laughs> and London yeah. did it. And, and so if you're a unionist, you really have to start thinking, well, you know, if my identity is dependent on Boris Johnson, I'm screwed, to, to mm. be quite frank. If my identity is dependent on a conversation uh, in which I have a very strong position, right, as 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 one of the major forces of plurality on the island, mm -hmm. um, then I think that's where the strength of unionism lies. And also to say, you know, you have the ability to shape it, to have input, yeah. to have an understanding of what's being suggested. Um, and there was a kind of debate around this, around the Senate and whether or not Ian Marshall would get his nomination and would he be there as an Ulster unionist voice? And I felt in many ways that that was missing the point that could one person ever represent Ulster unionism in a sense? And if there had to be a voice for Ulster unionism, shouldn't there be a voice for the non-aligned people? Shouldn't there be a voice for the, the Northern nationalist? Um, and we get to the stage where we're thinking about what people are actually beginning to think about is representation in the structures of government and what that representation might look like. And should it be 20 seats rather than what we have at the moment? Or should it be a complete deconstruction of what exists and think again about where are voices heard? How are they heard in a meaningful way? Because we've heard so much about civic forums and our experience of them very often is talking shops with the usual suspects and really don't achieve very much. And people have become quite cynical about those. But going back to your point, I think uh, around the Irish Sea border and the promises that we would have unfettered access, even every, everyone looking at it thought, well, that's just impossible. Um, so clearly you're being lied to your face and you must realise it. But I do think there is a begin beginning of a dawning that English um, and particularly English nationalists have mentally ditched us have ditched Northern Ireland years ago and all those opinion polls coming out saying, well, would you prefer Brexit or keep the union? Well, they were fairly clear in their results that Brexit was the ambition. And in fact, we never really understood those people over there. If we get rid of them, it'll be no big loss. Um, I don't think we should celebrate that. It just simply says that we need to make the best of the plurality that exists here, acknowledge it, try to be generous uh, and frame that conversation. The difficulty always in the North is once you start to have that conversation, you're accused of being either a Republican or someone with a, an anti-English, anti-British agenda. But I do think that post-Brexit um, and after the transition period, we may be able to have those conversations in a more meaningful way because the realisation will be the landscape has changed dramatically and we are not going back. And as much as you want to, I suppose what I would have hoped at this stage is the delusions would have gone and we would be now beginning to accept reality. I see very little sign of that when you read the broadsheets, the English broadsheets. The story hasn't changed at all. It's still going to be fantastic 
it's going to be world beating. It's going to be world class. And you're thinking, this is absolute delusional nonsense. Now, maybe we might have accepted that in 2017, but we are leaving in a matter of months time. And businesses here have absolutely no idea what it's going to mean for them. There's no clarity because we're still in the denial phase. But logic would tell you that many small businesses will be worried about their future. Um, People here in Northern Ireland will be worried about the increased costs, which are inevitable. And remembering that we are the poorest region by far. I think we really have to think about how are we going to mitigate what is clearly going to happen? And we can't almost like we've done before, wait until it happens and then say, oh, we're very poorly prepared for this. Um, so I do think all of those economic and political uh, coming together create a perfect storm for us to have a realistic conversation about the future of this island. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I would heartily agree with all that. You know, um, I, I, I mean, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. It's, it's quite absolutely right. No, there's, there's nothing to celebrate in, in any of this stuff. You know, both Brexit yeah. and the coronavirus are disastrous. They're, they're absolutely terrible. Um, and anybody who feels any kind of schadenfreude about, you know, about tens of thousands of unnecessary deaths in, in, in England, you know, really uh, doesn't deserve to be part of this conversation at all. Mm -hmm. But the fact is that, that there is no going back. You know, the, 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 these are, it, either one of these things would have changed the world that we inhabit. The, the two of them coming together um, changes the world we inhabit and in particular the peace of the world that we happen to share right. in very profound ways, you know, and we don't even understand them all. We, don't, we have no idea really how Brexit's going to really play out. We've no idea how the coronavirus crisis, which we're still very much in the middle of, is, is, is going to play out. But we do know that none of these things, the, the, the effects of these things are not going to be short term. Right? So yeah. we also know that our economies are, are destroyed. And then they have this other kind of, you know, just <laughs> talk about kicking someone when they're down, you know, get, your, get all of our economies down on the floor and then come along and thump them with Brexit, you know, it's, it with maybe a no deal Brexit. It's just it's yeah. insane. So, so, so we, we know that we're in crisis mode. We know that what needs to be done is a radical rebuilding. Right? So the option of the status quo just doesn't exist, right? There is no status quo. It's, it's, we're, we're in something else. Mm -hmm. um, and we either let that unfold in a chaotic way, which is still full of delusion and lies and crazy nationalist exceptionalism, uh, or we accept that these relationships are changing and that we can shape them. We're, 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 we're still human beings. We're still intelligent. We're still creative. Um, we still have the capacity to actually shape these things um, for our benefit. And, and thinking about, you know, the vast things that we share, like, like it's not just kind of right, but like our health systems. But I mean, I mean, how the hell are we going to face the climate crisis yeah. as, as, as two entities on the island? You know, I mean, it's just, it's, it's idiotic, you know? Um, so from the very practical levels of how businesses are going to, are going to function, uh, to the larger geopolitical questions of like where's Britain in the, in the world right now you know it, it, it's nowhere it's 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 a lost place mm -hmm. um, it's 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 going to be faced probably with losing its a Brexit ally in, in Trump hopefully in in November <laughs> it, it's at war with China it's it's at war with Europe it's you know th this is profound stuff and 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 so uh it's not even necessarily being optimistic. I think it's just being realistic to say that that we're we're, we're going to be forced into conversations about how we rebuild and recreate. Yeah. Um, and whatever perspective you have, some form of that rebuilding is is going to have to be in the frame of an island-wide community. What, what precise political shape that takes, I think, is a, is a whole other set of questions. But if we don't engage with this, it's not going to go away. Nobody's inventing this stuff. Nobody's saying, let's sit down and talk about a United Ireland because it would be a good idea. <laughs> you know, well, yeah. some people are, but I, I, think, I think what most people are saying is, look, th th there's, a, there's a real genuine set of changes happening uh, and we're either the victim of those changes or, or we can try to shape them collectively in some way. Yeah, and I, I think you know, regardless of your political perspective, there is a, an acknowledgement that the political architecture of this island that has held for over 100 years since the creation of the state is now deeply unstable. 
and we have a chance to intervene and, and shape that change or sit around and wait and let it happen. And I think maybe our conclusion to our talk is that uh, from, from both our points of view, it's important to get in there and try and shape it and talk and be as generous and open. And there is much that um, we share. And in terms of outcomes, I think if we, if we focused on what, what, what we wanted to see, we would probably come up with a, a list that would be the same for most people. Yep. And that's where we should start, isn't it? It is. Mm -hmm.